Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending uh, Credit Union Survival in a uh, challenging environment. Welcome. Uh, this is Tom Satino. Uh, many of you guys may know me. I'm a calling officer for many of the credit unions in upstate New York, and I have a handful of uh, credit unions down in the New York City area and uh, one in New Jersey. I'm also here with Alex Cernoz, and he welcomes everyone as well. Um, this is uh, going to be an exciting uh, webinar. We have 45 or 75 credit union members attending today. And we also have a couple of prospects attending uh, from as far away as Puerto Rico, have a uh, prospect in New Jersey, and also from New York. But um, I wanted to introduce Frank uh, Ferrone of Darling Consulting. Well, we have a longstanding relationship with Frank and Darling Consulting. Um, we um, have many discussions regarding asset liability management, and he's also uh, consultant to some of our members uh, in New York. And also, Frank has a portfolio of institutions uh, nationwide in which he does uh, asset liability management consulting. So um, this webinar really came about through uh, many discussions Frank and I and many of the other folks here at the Home Loan Bank have had regarding the current interest rate environment and what uh, current, currently is the difficult environment that many institutions are facing. So uh, I want to thank Frank, and I want to turn it over to Frank now to uh, get the webinar underway. Thanks, Tom. Welcome, everybody. Um, you know, the last few years have certainly been an eye-opening experience uh, for the industry. Um, you know, one of the many results of this environment has been a, a complete rewrite of the, by the regulatory community of its expectations for what constitutes appropriate balance sheet management. And so um, I'm going to spend some of my time today talking about what the regulatory expectations are, what I think are, are some of the common uh, issues that get in the way uh, of credit unions taking action and, and doing what I believe is the right thing for the balance sheet because of some of the regulatory expectations, some of the, uh, uh, some of the you know, highly misunderstood uh, regulations that are in place. And then what I want to do is I want to spend the majority of my time um, talking about strategies. What are some things that we ought to be thinking about in the current environment? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think for a, for a lot of uh, the credit unions that, uh, that I come across with, um, I think what it comes down to at the end of the day is just the basic business of, of uh, managing a credit union. What business are we in? And I think if, if we spend a little time building a foundation as to what business that we're in, um, I think that's going to go a long way in terms of what we're going to need to do from a strategy development perspective. So in terms of, in terms of the outline, uh, technical difficulty here. There we go. Um, here's, here's the agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the issues um, in the credit union industry, talk a little bit about the earnings model. How does the, what is the basic business of a credit union? And I'm going to talk about the, um, the whole issue behind NEV, uh, regulators' thoughts, our thoughts, um, and then the basic liquidity measurement and uh, management of a credit union. And I think that's going to go a long way in terms of setting the stage for the risk-return trade-offs that I think are, are available in front of all of you. And I would submit that as, as, as many issues that, as there are in this low-rate environment, um, I think there's a, a heck of a lot of opportunity for the credit unions here uh, on the phone. You know, it's my understanding that um, probably the majority of, of the credit unions um, on, on the phone you know, don't actively use the wholesale market. And there, I think, is a huge opportunity uh, that we're going to talk about. And, and this is not just because I'm here at the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, I will tell you that of all the credit unions that I work with, with the exception of one, I'm working on them, but with the exception of one credit union, every single credit union I work with borrows money. Every single one of those credit unions has higher levels of wholesale funding today than they've ever had historically. You know, my guess is those that are listening in on the phone today probably shaking their head. How can that be? We've got more liquidity than Carter has pills, and I'm going to explain to you exactly why. Um, regulatory accounting. Uh, I'll touch on some of the accounting issues versus the business issues and what gets in the way. And then we'll go right into some strategies that I think all of us uh, can, put into, can put into place. This is Tom again. I just want to quickly mention um, we're going to have a Q&A at the end, the uh, last 15 minutes. Uh, so throughout the whole webinar, please feel free to type in questions on, on a flow basis, and then we'll address them at the very end. Okay. You know, as I mentioned, th there is... 
there's a new day has dawned in terms of regulatory management, and I can tell you that the regulators have raised the bar to new heights in terms of what they expect your credit union to do in terms of measuring, documenting, managing liquidity, interest rate risk, capital. Um, and, you know, the rules have been changed and the exam res results continue, as we see it, to demonstrate that the regulators expect that bar to be readily clear. You know, the good old days are over in terms of running the basic reports. And one of the things I can tell you is um, everything that's in the new guidance that came, back, that came out in 2010, not only do we believe that these are the things that you should be doing, but at the end of the day, these are going to help you to make better business decisions when you have the right information and you're running the right scenarios. And I'll talk about those as we go through. Um, you know, some of the slides when we talk about uh, strategy development, right? The two, the two pronouncements, uh, I can tell you, again, the examiners are loaded for bear and you better be prepared because if not, it gets in the way, again, of making better business decisions. And so it's probably, uh, and believe me, I was around in the, in the 80s and the 90s, um, and I tell you, this is probably one of the toughest regulatory environments that we've seen since the 80s, the early 80s and 90s. A lot of the examiners come in, as I said, loaded for bear, looking for something to document. And so from the credit union's perspective, I can tell you that the key issues, uh, number one, asset quality. I don't see a lot of asset quality problems in the credit union industry, but as you are aware, you know, NCUA particularly, they want high levels of capital, high levels of liquidity, and they want very low interest rate risk. And what I mean by that is, and this is one of the biggest issues that I see, again, in the credit union industry specifically, and that is NCUA is very fearful of rising rates. You know, the FDIC came out and said, uh, there's nowhere to go but up. And what's happened since then? Rates have gone sideways to down. NCUA, everything that they look at is geared towards right, rising rates. And I'm going, to, I'm going to demonstrate to you and hopefully convince you that most of you, uh, rising rates is a welcome um, uh, opportunity. And you shouldn't be fearful of rising rates. Yet I would submit that probably many of you and maybe, maybe the majority of you um, um, show exposure to rising rates when you run your interest rate risk models. And, I can, and I'll, we'll talk about some of the reasons why I think that's probably the case. One of the other things when it comes to um, the, interest, the advisory on interest rate risk management, I'm going to touch on a couple of key points so that when we talk about strategy development and we talk about some of the things that we ought to be thinking about, um, you know, this will ring clear in terms of what some of the issues are. There is a lot of inconsistency in the field when it comes to the new, the new guidance. And I can tell you it's different between OCC, FDIC, NCOA. It's different uh, between field examiners. And so one of the things that um, uh, we did was we went through, we spent a lot of time going through the guidance, word by word by word. And then there was so much um, ambiguity that, you know, we sat down with the regulators to try to clarify what some of these issues were. And I can tell you, they kind of smiled. And they realized, you know what, you're right. We probably ought to come up with you know, a follow-up to the guidance, which they did, right? Even when they came up with the follow-up, the FAQ, we still had a lot of questions because there was still ambiguity. And uh, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I'd be happy to enjoy it to send this to you guys, and that is I wrote kind of an FAQ on the FAQ because still there was some ambiguity. So there's a lot of inconsistencies, and I'll walk through those as we talk through uh, the presentation. One thing I can tell you, though, is uh, it's perfectly clear. And that is, it's not simply enough just to measure. Um, the regulators now want you to not just to measure, but they want you to manage your risk. They're very, very clear on this. And running alternative scenarios, running what if scenarios, is clearly the key in understanding what your true risk position is, both from a liquidity standpoint and from an interest rate risk standpoint. Um, one of the things that I rarely ever see when it comes to interest rate risk management um, in the credit union industry 
is running alternatives, running what-if scenarios. What if we did this? What if we leveraged the capital? What if we held mortgages? What if we pre-invested cash flow? What if we extended our liabilities? Um, what does it look like? Right? And without running those what-if scenarios, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. There's huge opportunities in front of all of you. And again, I'm going to go through some of those common strategies that I think all of you probably can put into place with very little, very little risk. Here's the dilemma, as I talked about. When it comes to, and this is our concern, stipulations within the guidance that reference requirements, quote unquote, that aren't necessarily required. Many of you probably have examiners coming in that saying certain things are required in the guidance. The reality is they're not all required, quote unquote. And I'll go through some of the things that I think you should be doing um, that aren't necessarily required, and those things that are required that you should be doing just to kind of keep the regulators at bay, all right? So th there, is, there is a perception, all right? And again, this is our concern. There's checklists that the regulators come in with. That, that's the literal interpretation when they come in versus what is the spirit of the guidance? And that's where I think judgment um, um, can, can be used. The frustration is, again, the inconsistency that we see among different regulatory agencies, but also even within, you know, um, each agency. And so, for example, with the NCOA, I get all different um, reactions to um, mortgages, concentration risk, um, NEV, running shocks, running ramps, static balance sheets. Um, so, I, again, I'm going to go through some of these as we go through the presentation. But here's what I did. I thought it would be helpful just to kind of do some Cliff Notes version. I took elements out of the guidance, right? I kind of paraphrased them, and then down at the bottom, kind of what my interpretation is. So for example, the regulators expect all of the credit unions to manage their interest rate risk exposures using processes and systems that are commensurate with their earnings and capital levels, complexity, business model, risk profile, scope of operation. That's a mouthful. What does it mean? Well, again, in the spirit of the guidance, it seems to imply judgment is expected and that there is no one-size-fits-all approach. And you know what? The regulars don't disagree with that. But all too often what I see is a whole list of things that the regulators come in with and demand that they be done. I've had more credit unions call me this year because they've got, uh, they're under agreements with the regulators that are insisting that they run certain scenarios. Right? So while I appreciate the business, the reality is, most of the time, th these, these requests are unfounded. How about interest rate risk reports? Uh, they should be distributed to senior management and the board, and they should provide aggregate information and supporting detail that is sufficient to enable them to assess the sensitivity of rate changes. What does that all mean? What does that all mean? It seems to imply that a financial institution's ability to demonstrate its understanding of, of risk of their risk position is an important litmus test. Right? So again, there isn't a one size fits all strategy. The computer's going here. How about running shocks? I mean, I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but um, the guidance came out and said 200 basis point changes in rates may not be sufficient. It isn't sufficient. It never has been sufficient. Right? And so that begs the question, what do we need to do in terms of running rate scenarios? You should regularly assess your exposures beyond these typical conventions of up and down too, right? And you should have rates of greater magnitude, e.g., up and down 300 and 400, right? Now, is that instantaneous? Is that a shock? Is it permanent? Um, and then they also want you to run non-parallel yield curve shifts. You should be doing that. So, for example, uh, they talk about twists of the yield curve. Really, all that means is a flattening of the yield curve given where we are today in the rate cycle. So here's the one I think is, is very important, and that is it says institutions should ensure the scenarios are severe but plausible. Severe but plausible in light of the existing level of interest rates. So where are we, at, where are we in the rate cycle? We're at the lowest point in all of our careers, right? Um, you can't go down 100 or more than 100 from here, yet I have examiners saying you should go down 200, 300 and up one, up two, up three, up four. 
right? Now, running instantaneous and permanent shocks of 200, 300, 400, yeah, those are severe, but are they plausible? No. Yet I find most credit unions tend to run shocks, instantaneous and permanent shocks. And when they do that, most, most of them come up with um, a risk profile that says they've got exposure to rising rates, both from an income perspective and from an NEV perspective. I don't have a single credit union that I work with that comes anywhere close to having exposure to rising rates in a shocked environment. They all do better. And their NEV is all better in a rising rate environment, shock scenario, than it is in the current environment. So if you're not seeing that when you run your scenarios, that begs the question why, and I'm going to explain in a minute why that, that is likely the case. Right? Depending upon your risk profile, stress scenarios should include, but not be limited to, instantaneous and significant changes in the level of, instant, of interest rates, instantaneous rate shocks, and substantial changes in rates over time. Prolonged rate shocks. That comes right out of the guidance. What does that mean? There seems to be some confusion here regarding shocks. Shocks, by definition, are instantaneous versus ramps, which are, by definition, over time. Why do they use the word prolonged to qualify shock? Ask most regulars, and they won't know. That's not a criticism. I'm just telling you. What we need to do at the end of the day is run scenarios that we believe are reasonable, plausible, and help us to make better decisions. In the meantime, we need to run some of these other shocks right, to show what the extremes are and if there is a situation in which we've got exposure, then dig down a little bit deeper under the hood to figure out what the reasons are. Well, that is not the end, but I do thank you. I've got two computers going here. Let's go back to the, go back to the beginning. My fingers are too big for this keyboard, I think. Are people having questions coming along the, uh, the way? No. Okay. Yes. They can type them in, though. Yes. Okay. So if you do have questions along the way and you type them in, I will see them, and I will be more than happy to answer them as, as we go. Pick any slide. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about this, folks. We didn't rehearse this today. But I am in New York at the federal. When it comes to, to the guidance, um, frustrating is most of the policies that are written by credit unions, I don't know if they're shared amongst credit unions or what, but they tend to be developed and designed to appease regulators. To um, looking at, right? We've, and I, we see this all the time, ratios that you look at. NCUA, that. But no. So what scenarios should we be running? How many years should we be going out? What scenario should be core? What scenario should, should change every single time? I'm going to go through those when we look at the scenarios, but is, and then help use that position to help us to formulate, facilitates dialogue. You get all the key personnel from the organization um, with their input, valuable scenarios. All too often, I think, alphas fall short because they don't do that. So right now, there's unsettled weather, both both from a, a regulatory climate. I don't know how many of you have read the new regulation. It's eight, um, uh, how many people in the, in, the, in the mortgage business, but the new regulations that came out from NCUA, it's 800 pages. I got as far as 312 pages and I stopped. If the only page you look at is page 312, it'll scare you, right? Um, the political environment. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty in the, in the, in the political arena. Um, what's going on with the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau? What's going on from a regulatory perspective? Interest rates are low, and they're probably likely to stay low for an extended period of time. And it's that extended low rate environment, I think, is going to create the most problems for the financial industry, both banks and credit unions. I'm going to show you why. Um, and then the industry outlook. I, you know, I'm going to submit, when I look at the numbers, I think out of, out of the credit unions, all of the credit unions out there, I think there's probably about 2,500 that I've seen that I think are in grave danger of, of survival. And, and it's probably even in more. Right? And it doesn't have to be that way. Right? So that's, that's kind of my industry outlook when it comes to the credit union. So what is the impact of all this on credit unions? I think what you're going to find is 
growth is going to continue to slow. Um, given what the regulators want, they want more liquidity, less interest rate risk, more capital. That ultimately leads to um, less growth, slower growth. There's going to be pressure on gross revenues. I'm going to talk about the basic business model of a credit unit. And I'm going to point out to you what we believe is the basic business model and where your opportunities are and where your risks are. But I can tell you right now, it's like the roof is caving in on the asset side. Most credit unions tend to have a very short asset base. A lot of that is primarily driven by some of the ratios that the regulators look at. They're fearful of rising rates. Uh, they're always biased against rising rates. And so most credit unions tend to keep short assets. They don't like to hold long assets. And you know, given where we are in the rate cycle and the low rates and the, the flat curve rate right out to five years, most of the credit unions um, in the industry have assets that are repricing down so fast, so furiously, that there's, the revenues keep coming down, 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 and there's not a whole heck of a lot of room left on the funding side. And so margins will continue to come under pressure for the foreseeable future with no relief in sight. So what do we do? We'll talk about that. Um, fee income. You know, there's new, there's new regulations, number one. Number two, um, you know, fees, fees are going away or, or fees are declining in the industry. Um, most of you are probably witnessing that, uh, witnessing that now. Meanwhile, you've got higher expenses ahead. So if we've got pressure coming from the top, revenues are coming down, there's not a whole heck of a lot of room left to lower our funding costs. So for some of you, I think there's, there's still a lot of room. Um, you've got higher costs of risk management, higher re regulatory compliance costs, NCUA assessment. Right? All of these things are contributing to lower levels of, of income moving forward. And so what that means is, the implication is, we've got to think differently. We've got to think differently in terms of our deposit strategy. And I'm going to go through each and every one of these. Our loan strategy, how we manage our capital. You know, a 10% capital ratio isn't necessarily better than 8. Right? 12 isn't necessarily better than 10. Right? It depends how you're managing that capital. About liquidity, I think liquidity management is going to be the key. Particularly for today, uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on liquidity management. Wholesale, which goes hand in hand with wholesale funding. A lot of credit unions just don't use the wholesale markets. I don't know necessarily why, but we're going to talk about those issues. Right? And then ultimately, what are, what are our earnings at risk? You know, if you're only modeling your balance sheet out a year or two years, you may not see what I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Right? Ultimately, all these things lead to survival of the fittest. And my concern for most of the people in the credit union industry, and those folks on the phone today, is I just want to make you aware of, kind of what's coming at you. And then, uh, again, I'll give you some things that I think are reasonable strategies to manage through and muscle through this environment. And again, I think we're going to be down here for an extended period of time. We've got to think differently. Why? Because the market conditions demand it. You know, the good old days are over. This low rate environment, right, is, is probably the worst environment that you can operate in. And yet, think about it from a regu regulator's perspective. If you went back two, three, four years ago, what was the biggest concern? Rising rates, rising rates, rising rates. And, and yet, here we are in a low rate environment, and margins are shrinking and they're going to continue to shrink. And I think for the first time, the regulators are realizing that you're right. Rising rates is not the worst thing. A low rate environment um, is more problematic. In terms of the rate outlook, um, we're, I think we're down for a while. Um, I'll, um, I'll give you guys a copy of the article I wrote back in 2008, um, where I, I talked about um, you know, the perfect storm, all of these things converging. Uh, you had this, uh, all of the things that led to the perfect storm of where we are in this rate environment, supersized leverage, easy money, um, fair market value accounting, and the list goes on and on and on, the housing market. All these things um, created this, this perfect storm that um, uh, reminded me of the Minsky moment. And so I wrote this article called The Minsky Moment. And for those of you that don't know Hyman Minsky, he was a kind, of a, you know, kind of a crazy Keynesian. But his theory was the longer the period of stability, 
the longer the period of instability when instability finally hits. And what does that mean? It's a mouthful. Uh, in effect, if you think about where we, before 2006, before 2007, when things finally hit the fan uh, in 2008, we had the longest period of prosperity. You know, in the banking, I'll use it as a verb, um, industry. And so it led to supersized leverage, um, all the things that I talked about earlier, and then all of a sudden the proverbial house of cards collapsed. That long period of stability is now, now we're in a period of instability. And because it took so long to get to where we are today, I think Heinrich Minsky was right. And I think that what that means is we're going to be down here for a long, long, long period of time. This is not going to be your typical cycle where every you know, two to three years we have changes in interest rates and we have recoveries. So my guess is, right, short rates are likely to stay down for a long time. Long rates are likely to stay down for a long time. But we're probably going to see the curve steepen before the short end moves. Right? Bernanke came out and talked about a 6.5% unemployment rate. I, you know, I don't know. I think we're a long ways off there, too. But in the meantime, we can't just sit and do nothing. And what the implication is, is that margins are, are under siege for most. When I say most, I mean almost everybody. You know, we work with about 500 institutions, and I can tell you with rare exception, do we see any institution where, you know, this current rate environment doesn't show continued decline in margin, continued decline in income. I feel like a skunk at a picnic, right? You know, there's, <laughs> but there is good news. I mean, there are some opportunities. This, this is a typical credit union interest rate risk profile. This is one of my clients, right? I, I could show you, you know, every single one of my clients, and with rare exception, you know, they all look pretty much the same. Those bar graphs represent base case scenario, static balance sheet. What does that mean? Static balance sheet, by the way, means no growth. It doesn't mean everything stays on the balance sheet in its present form, right? That, you know, I've had a huge, you know, disagreement with regulators on that. And, it, and if anybody ever has an issue with that, you know, write me an email because I've written a long, long response that seems to placate the regulators. Anyway, bar graphs, base case scenario, you can see net interest income is trending down. The down arrows point towards a flattening curve. Long end comes down by 100, and we flatten short rates out at a quarter. The rising uh, arrows there show an up 200 ramp ramped over 12 months. So that rising rate environment up 200 is great, theoretically. The problem is I think we're a long way off. Now this is a two-year horizon. What does it look like beyond two years? All of you should be running your models out to five years. Two years is not enough. Because sometimes you hit inflection points. In this particular case, as rates continue to go up over the next year, if, it, if we stay in that sustained rising rate environment, earnings continue to go higher and higher and higher. If you believe that rates are down here for a while and you maintain a static balance sheet, no growth, look at the bar graphs. Net interest income, which is the majority of your income for most of you, right, continues to go down, 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 down with no end in sight. You have so many assets that are continuing to reprice and recycle down, and again, you don't have a lot of relief on the funding side. Most of that has already run through the balance sheet. Now, this tells us nothing about how much money we put in our pocket at the end of the day. Right. Look at, um, now we add some stress scenarios. I added a couple of more scenarios. One is, I'm running rates up 400 over 24 months. That's kind of the white triangles. You can't see it's behind the purple ones. The purple ones is we take rates and we flatten the curve. We bring rates up 500 in the short end and we flatten the curve. It wasn't that long ago when we were in that scenario, if you think back to 2007. Those rates came from 2007. In all scenarios, in a rising environment, in a flattening scenario, this credit union continues to do better and better and better. Most of you, I would submit, look like that. if modeled properly with reasonable and rational uh, assumptions. Now, here's an earnings simulation where I run shocks, right? And this is for not just, this isn't EVE or NEV, this is net interest income. Now we do shock scenarios. Look what happens when you shock rates up. Earnings go higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, the higher rates go. Try to convince a regulator of that. 
it's not the easiest thing. I've fought with them. I, I've, I've had discussions with them for many years, right? And they don't believe it. I think they're starting to believe it now. All right, so keep, keep this in mind because I'm going to show you the same credit union where this is their income, and then it's just income in a rising rate environment. Shock. What's the best case scenario here? Up 400. Now, when I run an NEV calculation, what do you think happens? I could tell you, right, depending upon what assumptions you use, it may not necessarily show better results in a higher rate environment. We're going to look at that. And therein, I think, lies one of the biggest problems in the industry, is that NEV calculation. So that same institution, let's now look at net income. When I look at net income, what do you see? You know, we're making money over year one and year two. If you run that out beyond year two, and you go into, into uh, 2000, end of 14 into 2015, they're showing a loss. And I'm assuming no credit problems between now and then. Meanwhile, you're hardly making any money. Right? This is true of most credit unions I see, of most banks that I see. If I look at the falling rate environment, you know, out 15 months, we're losing money. And that's a problem. Margins are coming down. Income is coming down. And that puts your capital at risk. So the dynamics are going to change in the industry. I think you're going to see fewer, larger credit unions. And by the way, when you look at the NCUA statistics, and I'm not here to bash NCUA, right? But when you look at the numbers, it looks like everything is rosy. And that's because you have some very, very, very large credit unions that make a lot of money. And a lot of it's fee-driven, but they distort the numbers. If I just look at the industry as a whole, consolidated, everything looks good. The reality is it's only good for the few. The majority of credit unions are, are small. You know, when I say small, less than $500 million. And, and those are the ones I think are at the greatest uh, risk. Right? So there's going to be a lot of mergers of small credit unions. It's going to happen, I promise you, only because I see the numbers. Right? Lower returns are ahead. I mean, 1% is kind of always been my target for return on assets for, for my clients. 75 basis points is now the new, the new uh, 1%. A lot of credit unions are going to see more fee income. The problem with that is it's harder to get, number one, and a lot of those fees are going away. This last point here, the use of wholesale funding, um, it's going to be needed. You're going to have to use the wholesale markets right, to control your cost of money, not just now but moving forward, and to manage your interest rate risk and manage your capital. And when I say manage your capital, a lot of, a lot of the credit unions have a lot of excess capital. And by having a lot of that excess capital and not using it efficiently, it's costing them a lot of money. So I think we're going to talk a little bit about, actually we're going to talk a lot about um, liquidity management, wholesale funding, and I think that will help um, a lot of you today figure out what some of your opportunities are. But at the end of the day, net interest income is going to remain the biggest driver for most. It's not going to be the fee income. So. If net interest income it drives the majority of your income, it's probably 80 to 85 percent of most credit union income. That's a meaningful reference point when we talk about risk. So using that as a, a reference point, right? Think about the pressures that are mounting right now on your net interest income. Your net interest income is really that's really your gross profit, and that's really a function of how big you are, right? The size of your balance sheet and multiply times the yield on your assets, subtracting out your cost of funds. So yield on assets minus my cost of funds multiplied times my balance sheet gives me net interest income. Right? You don't have to be a CPA to figure that out. That's so simple, yet I think a lot of us lose sight of that. Because I can tell you right now that margin's coming down. So if I want to maintain the same level of income, what have I got to do? I've got to grow the balance sheet or change my mix. Or do what? Lower my cost of funds. <clears throat> so my guess is <clears throat> that the typical credit union business model is at risk, given where we are from a regulatory perspective and from, from where we are in the, in the current rate environment. So we've got to think differently about how we create income and then how do we manage that income. Simple. 
yet I, I rarely see this when I look at a policy, and that is, what is the objective of ALCO? You all sit around your ALCO meetings, and you know, I think if you ask each person at the ALCO, you know, what is the whole objective? Why are we here today? Some of them might say, well, it's regulatory appeasement. I've got to make sure we're within our guidelines, right? Um, but the reality is, ALCO's objective, from our perspective, is to optimize net interest income. That's really your gross profit. Optimize that net interest income, both in the near term and the long term, while managing our liquidity, interest rate risk, and capital. Simple, right? That's our objective. Five key questions every single one of you ought to be asking yourselves at every ALCO meeting. And that is, do we have adequate capital? How much liquidity do we have? How much liquidity do we need? How much do we want to pay for our liquidity? Because at the end of the day, your liquidity really is it's your raw materials. It goes into your end product. We're going to talk about that in a minute. How much exposure do we have to changes in rates? about the, the rate changes that I showed you before, the ramps, the shocks, the flattening curves, and are we being paid adequately for the risk we take? I promise you, if you ask those questions and you answer those questions, right, the solutions are easy. So let's walk through some of this. The first thing I want to do is create an appropriate perspective on really what is the basic business of a credit union. As simple as this sounds, right, it's very important. I work with a credit union that's $7 million, and we also work with some institutions that are, are located right here in New York, some of the largest banks in the world. And we go through the same exercise that I'm going to go through with you right now, and that is going through the basic business, whether you're a credit union or a bank. If you think about a manufacturing analogy, right, and, and I'm a recovering accountant, right, but think back to a, your basic uh, manufacturing analogy from Accounting 101. How does a manufacturer generate revenues? They sell stuff. They sell products. We have to subtract out our cost of raw materials, our cost of goods, and that gives us a gross profit. Right? So far, so good. Simple. Let's, let's think about that in terms of a credit union. What are, a credit un what are your credit union's products? Would you say it's the loans and the investments? Would you say it's on the liability side of the balance sheet, your savings accounts, now accounts, club accounts, share drafts, et cetera, or would you say it's both? Herein lies the problem, and that is it's no different whether you're, whether you're selling widgets or you're, you're a credit union selling money. At the end of the day, what generates revenues at the credit union is loans and investments, and we know that those, those, those sale prices, so to speak, are coming down, down, down. We subtract out our raw material costs, which is what? It's money. You subtract out your cost of funds, and that gives you your gross profit, net interest income. Now, that's so simple, yet I think sometimes we lose sight of that. And that's going to that's gonna play a part in terms of strategy development. In effect, you basically you buy and you sell money. So that being the case, right, when it comes to interest rate risk management, net interest income versus NEV, <clears throat> what is your position? I know what the answer is for most of you. It's NEV. That's your primary focus. That's what the regulators look at. Our primary focus is always net interest income. I'm less concerned with value at risk. I'm more concerned with earnings at risk. And so secondarily, um, NEV, primarily net interest income. Now, your, your income is primarily a result of your intermediation function not changes in value. And we'll go through an NEV calculation, right? I'm not going to talk about FASB and fair value, but I think this is the, one of the biggest issues that gets in the way of taking action for most of you, and that is that whole NEV calculation. Now, is NEV a useful tool? You know, you know the old expression, you never want to tell somebody that their baby is ugly? It's the same thing, I think, with when it comes to NEV. You don't want to tell the regulators that this is just a useless calculation I sat in on a webinar, and what I understand is this is just a useless calculation, right? You will not win friends at the NCUA. However, if you think about it, at the end of the day, really what is NEV? It's a liquidation calculation. You shock your balance sheet, and you see what the value changes are. Now, you can look at all the math. This is the same credit union I showed you before, right? You look at all the math on the left, 
right? I think it's easier to look at the graphs on the right. And what you notice here is in the down 100 scenario, they lose significant value. In a rising rate environment, every single scenario, the higher rates go, the higher the NEV. Right? Now, that's consistent with their level of earnings, as I showed you in the shock scenarios. Now, but, uh, sorry, again. I'm, I'm going to continue on until we get back to that page. Um, here, here's the problem with NEV. Right? It is a liquidation calculation, number one. Number two, remember when I talked about being severe but plausible? How plausible is an instantaneous and permanent shock? Assume the other big problem. Assuming that you're modeling this properly, what does the NCUA want you to do in terms of, of average life of core deposits? Two and a half years. Remember that nearest study? What if you were to use five-year? We use the five-year average life short of doing a core deposit study. I think if you did a core deposit study, you find your average core deposit is probably the seven and a half years. Can I hit enter without? Forward hour. Okay. No. Right, here, here we were. Okay. In this in this model, if you look at the liabilities, non-maturity deposits, what you're going to see is as rates go higher and higher and higher and higher, that number gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? You're gaining value. A lower liability works to your advantage. One of the things I would suggest you do is run it with a five-year average life, unless you have a core deposit study. I'd use those numbers. Secondly, right, run these at par. In other words, the regulators right, want you to run your NEV for your core deposits. Because you can't sell them, by definition, you've got to carry them at par. The reality is that's unrealistic, right? But this, this just shows you the difference. This is the same credit union, except I keep everything at par. So now that begs the question, which one's right? If, you're, if you look like the one on the right, right, that's a problem. That's going to influence everything that you do from a balance sheet strategy perspective. You're going to tend to do what? Keep my assets short, keep my funding long. And given where we are in the rate cycle and the trends, that's exactly the opposite of really what you ought to be doing, right? You've got to be able to articulate to the examiners how you, um, you know, you've got to be able to defend your position, how you measure and how you manage your interest rate risk, right? Let's go into what I think is probably the most important part, and that is traditional measures for liquidity. We believe that liquidity is defined as the ability to raise money quickly at a reasonable cost without losing money. Simple, right? So. How do most of you look at liquidity? I can tell you, I see this all too often. You still use the typical loan to deposit ratio, right? Implied in the loan to deposit ratio, which is an old, old, old ratio, before you had access to the, the, the repo market, the Federal Home Loan Bank, that might have been a reasonable benchmark for measuring liquidity. The reality is it implies loans are illiquid. And deposits are my only source of funds. Excess cash and short-term investments on hand, is that liquid? Looks good on paper, but what about the yield? Particularly given today's rate environment, there's no difference between holding a 30-year Ginnie Mae security on the books versus Fed funds if you have access to the Federal Home Bank. They're both easily convertible to, to cash. So these old traditional measures are very crude barometers of liquidity, yet they're easy to understand, but they don't reflect the evolution of the markets. And I think a lot of you use these traditional measures. How do we look at it? We look at it differently. Loan to deposit, I don't care if it's 135%. Loan to deposit, you got all your cash and somebody else's cash, right? Short-term investments to assets. I know a lot of you use that. I don't care if you've got short-term cash, cash flow coming over the next 12 months, or it's tied up in a 30-year in a mortgage that I can access using the home loan bank. How about non-core funding? What's a volatile liability? I promise you, you've got collateral at the Federal Home Loan Bank, you can borrow money until the cows come home. Right? That's no different right, than having a high cost, you know, a volatile liability is a high cost CD as far as I'm concerned. Right? Cash flow. How about cash flow over the next 12 months? That does you no good when you need funding today. So these are old antiquated measurement tools that I think a lot of you still use. Um, it's very different than the way we look at it. Modern day, the reality is, Raising cash, liquidity, it doesn't require you to sell assets or have high-cost CD specials if you have access to 
just-in-time inventory management, the home loan bank. Or you go to the repo market, or there's other alternatives, national market CDs or broker CDs. The reality is your least expensive source right now, by far, is the federal home loan bank. Right? So what's the advantage of that approach? It's real world. It shows your funding capacity. All of you should understand what your total capacity is you know, at the home loan bank. It doesn't matter if you have stuff in available for sale or held to maturity if you borrow against it. I, I still see a lot of credit unions that have held to maturity. Um, it optimizes your liquidity yield. If you've got money sitting in Fed funds, say, at a quarter, and you've got 15-year mortgage loan demand, why not just soak up that cash in the form of 15-year mortgages? And I'll show you some examples. You know, probably why. You're either concerned about liquidity or you're concerned about interest rate risk. And I'll show you why neither one of them should be an issue. Right? I'm not going to go through this basic surplus ap approach, but basically what we're looking at here is how much cash do we have on hand, how much access to cash do we have, and what is our expectation over the next 90 days. I would submit that for most of you, you have more than sufficient cash and cash flow and access to cash that you don't have to be holding Fed funds. I wouldn't be holding a penny of Fed funds. I would be a net borrower in today's market. And yet I still see a lot of you holding excess cash. And if you're waiting for rates to go up, I think you're going to be like Linus in the pumpkin patch. Here's a typical example of a marginal cost analysis. Basically what it looks at is how much, how much are we paying um, for our money and what if we lowered the rate? This is toilet training for you guys. I won't walk you through this. I'll give you another example later. But um, you, know, you can just see if I'm paying 133 and I don't care if it's on a CD or what it's on. If I lower my cost and I retain the majority of the money, right, um, the marginal cost of keeping those rates high is extremely, extremely high. And I'll show you another example as we go through. But here's the key point here. And the reason I spent so much time on that is because how you view wholesale funding and how you view, view liquidity is going to have a huge impact on your deposit pricing. You're going to tend to price too high. Investment strategy, you're going to tend to stay short because you're looking at cash, cash flow. Loan strategy, you're going to tend to be short because you know, of interest rate risk or how it impacts your liquidity. How are you going to grow? Trying to grow um, in today's market through the retail market, you know, it, it's not easy. Uh, and paying up for deposits is not the, the, uh, uh, the most efficient way to grow your balance sheet today. All of these things, at the end of the day, add up to uh, a huge impact on your earnings stream. So we went through balance sheet management objectives. And again, it's optimizing your net interest income while managing liquidity, interest rate risk, and your capital. So when we look at the, you know, the key challenge right here is, you know, where it says maximum risk, maybe put, I don't know, put corporate credit union, you know, failed corporate credit union. In the middle, that's your credit union now going to the right, minimal risk, that's the NCUA. And at the end of the day, we need to manage risk. It's a risk management business, right? If you follow the middle column, you manage your capital, you manage growth, credit risk, liquidity risk, interest rate risk, you will optimize your income. If you go to the right and you do what, the, what makes the NCUA happy, the regulator, you will minimize your income. And remember, they're always looking at you in liquidation mode. And we talked about the whole NEV issue, right? Here's the other thing I see a lot of, and that is, um, you know, some people look at ALCO and they look at the ALCO package just a way to get kind of the monkey off our back, give it to the regulators, make sure we comply, and let's move on, right? The reality is it should support your decision making, right, uh, and facilitate dialogue at ALCO, not just something that appeases the regulator, right? So what's a credit union to do? Let's talk through some strategies. One thing I can tell you in terms of strategy development is, you can't stick your head in the sand and, and expect that, you know, when you pull your head out, it's going to be better. It won't be. It's likely to get worse from here. So the first step in terms of developing strategies is take a look at yourself and be realistic and ask yourself, do you truly have a handle on your risk position, as we talked about earlier? And if so, we can move on. I'm going to talk about uh, a few thoughts on some of these issues. Most of you are awash in liquidity with no end in sight, right? Most of you have too much cash. You've got too much cash now, and you've got more cash pouring in off the investment portfolio. You've got um, 
a CD is coming due, mortgage back is coming due, loans prepaying, right? So we got two choices. We have to invest or we've got to reduce our costs. So you think this is going to have an impact on our deposit pricing, our lending strategy, our investment strategy? You bet. Here's a sobering exercise. Here's a billion, this is a real example, a billion dollar institution, they've got $50 million in cash right now, and you know you can see over the next several quarters, the next four quarters, they've got uh, a cumulative of $114 million coming in. And they don't have a heck of a lot of loan demand, their loans are actually declining. So what do you think is going to happen to their income? And they're very asset sensitive. So what do we do? Well, let's just look at our deposit pricing. They were paying 10 basis points on checking, 25 basis points on savings, 85 basis points on a money market account. So just by squeezing down, because we got $50 million in cash, just by squeezing down our deposit rates an average of 15 basis points, that saves us $757,000. What's the worst that can happen? $50 million runs out the door, right? That's the equivalent of getting a 176 yield on that $57 million. This particular credit union, I can tell you, um, they lowered their cost. They took the checking down to 0.01, right, which is where all my clients are, as opposed to you know, 0.01 percent, one basis point. Savings went down to 15. Money markets went down to 45. And I think the net net impact was somewhere around a million one or a million two. And you know what happened? They didn't lose anything. The, the, the deposits continued to grow, right? We all have deposits that are going to leave the institution. And it's not necessarily driven by rate. The question becomes, you know, what is the implicit strategy here? Who are you attracting out in a time like this when you don't need the money? Now is the best. That's not your true cost. Your true cost is significantly higher than that. Here's a very simple marginal cost of funds. Here's a money market. They've got $250 million in. The rate's at 60, right? Uh, it's much lower than that today, but at the time, we looked at what if we just kind of walk these rates lower? Bring it down by 20 basis points, and let's see what happens. Let's go to 40. What this example shows is where it says rate reduction at the bottom. If we lower the rate by 20 basis points and 5% of the money walks out the door, we can replace that money at 4.4%, and we're indifferent. All right? And you can see what the rest of the numbers are. I can tell you, you know, you can't get a 440 yield anywhere. So that's the equivalent of let the money roll out the door. That's equivalent to getting a 440 yield without taking any interest rate risk. Right? So you have to ask yourself, is your cost of funds management, right? in other words, lowering your deposit rates, is that inconsistent with a deposit growth strategy? Not necessarily. You know, growing deposits isn't necessarily you know, the smartest thing to do in this environment. Right? How do we differentiate other than variables or uh, differentiate other than, than rate? Um, you know what? We could spend a whole day on that. The question becomes, if you're going to grow deposits, at what cost? It's very expensive to go out and chase money because of the marginal cost of raising new money. It's just cheaper to go wholesale if, if you need it. Most of you don't think you need it, right? So you've got too much liquidity. What's the impact on our loan strategy? Right? I can tell you right now, People are taking the gloves off. They are fighting for loans. I can tell you that the banks that we work with, it's all about loans, 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 loans. Shifting investment cash flow into loans. So what do we do on the residential side? Most of you probably don't feel comfortable holding fixed rate mortgages. I would submit you've got a ton of capacity to hold fixed rate mortgages. 15-year mortgages, no brainer. 30-year mortgages, I wouldn't have a problem with that either. If, you, if, if putting 30-year fixed rate mortgages on the books today at today's low rate, creates um, some discomfort because of your interest rate risk profile, I'll tell you what I would do. If I had the capital, I'd go wholesale. I, did, I, did, I went to an example this morning at the Home Loan Bank looking at blending some one-year money, some seven-year money, and 10-year money. And if you did that, you've got over a 2% spread. You're probably overfunded. But at the margin, if you soaked up some of your own cash, and then blend it with seven and ten-year borrowings, right? it's a no-brainer. I don't know how many of you um, realize this, but um, if you were to take, most of you, by the way, can borrow under the CI program. I mean, that's, that's simple, right? Uh, your RMs can show you how to do that. The fact that you get a dividend, currently it's, what's your dividend, four and a half? 
If I take a 4.5% dividend rate and I can borrow money at uh, like a one-year rate, I think it was 52. What was the math I did here? Um, you know, when I calculated a one-year CI rate, um, I, I, I think when I seven bits on the CI rate, yeah, one-year money CI rate is, is 27 basis points. When I factor in the four and a half dividend rate, it comes down to eight basis points. That's like stealing, and you don't pay any insurance premium on that. If I could show that to a bank. You, you, they back the truck up, right? So there's so much opportunity. I don't have time to go into it, but um, portfolio and loans, I'm telling you, is is, uh, is a huge opportunity for many of you. Um, conforming versus non-conforming. I think there's a, a huge opportunity to hold non-conforming. Non-conforming loans tend to get the what? They get the bad rate, the high rate. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. On the consumer side, home equities and autos. Sometimes I think autos are priced too low. Um, and again, we don't have time to go into a pricing strategy here, but um, home equity, um, not only not only can you offer longer term fixed rate home equities and probably pick up a lot of market share, but those also qualify as collateral at the home loan bank. So you're not giving up any collateral or, or any liquidity. Um, on the investment side, I would be hard pressed in today's environment to buy any investment given where rates are and premiums are today. Unless that curve backs up, and unless I had no loan demand, in which case I'd be forced to put on investments, you'd have to do it. But right now, I would probably be more inclined to book more loans, more mortgages. If you don't have the demand, then I'd go on the curve and I'd buy some well-structured mortgage backs. I would never buy a callable bond. If you've ever heard me ever before, I've always said, stay away from callable anything. Right? I don't care what time of the night it is, Call me. We'll get through it together. So it's really determining the lesser of evils, um, but it's all about loans, 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 and and loans, right? If you really need earnings badly and you've got lots of capital and you don't have the loan demand, then I'd go out on the curve uh, on the investment side. And a lot of you have a ton of capacity to go out long on the curve, right? If if you're modeling properly, I just know from looking at so many credit unions, right? Let's go through a couple of examples. All right. Here's example one. On the left, all right, that's what we look like as of that's back in March. All, right. all I did is I assumed that take all the investment cash flow that's rolling in off the investment portfolio and put it into 15 and 20 year mortgage backs, not even loans. Look at the difference. All right? Net net at the bottom, that's a significant amount of earning. This is the importance of running some what if scenarios. All right? Here's another example. And I can give you thousands of them. Right? Model validation. I worked with a credit union with a, they asked us to do a model validation and regulators were all over them because of their liability sensitivity, exposure to rising rates. This is what we came up with. What, do you, what does that look like to you? The last thing they need, right, they're the farthest thing from a liability sensitive institution. So the first thing we did is we lowered our money market rate. Look at the impact down at the bottom. Big number. What's the next thing we did? Right? They used to look at a one year gap and NEV. It showed them to be liability sensitive. That's a problem. You got to look beyond one to two years, right? So all I did here is rather than move my rates immediately, lag them by three months. It makes a huge difference, right? The third thing, right? Extend cash. So you can see if you're an asset sensitive institution, you've got lots of capacity to go out on the curve, right? Here's one that's kind of near term exposed to rising rates, long term asset sensitive. What'd we do? We did a mismatch leverage. So I gave you an example before. You know, you could book long mortgages, for example, probably the easiest way to grow it, and do some mismatch leverage. Take down some one year, two year, three year, four year, five year borrowings, blend it with some cash to get you through the next several years, right? And that adds incremental income, which reduces your sensitivity. Right? There's lots of different ways if you're liability sensitive to manage against rising rates, the reality is I don't think too many of you are exposed to rising rates. I'd be delighted to look at all your, uh, you know, uh, ALCO packages one by one. The reality is, right now, it's kind of expensive to extend on the curve. Um, again, unless you go through, I mean, it, you guys are probably net net after dividend and everything else the cheapest home loan bank in the country. I, I can't, don't quote me on that, but from what I've seen. 
Here's another thing where look at the balance sheet on the left. They look pretty darn good. This is one of my clients. I came back the next quarter, and they look like the right side. Now, what happened? Well, they panicked, and they said, you know what? We put a lot of long mortgages on. We did a lot of long stuff. Now we're going to roll all of our investments short instead of going long. Look, look at the impact. Look at the negative impact it's had in every single rate environment. Right? Um, this one was just a pricing strategy. But what you can see here is what's important is identifying your risk position and then taking action, running some alternatives. Right? Here's a simple extending 45 million of Fed funds into mortgages. They've got the capacity. Right? I could give you a thousand examples, but what you notice is every single one of these credit unions, they all do better in a rising rate environment. Here's a simple one, cost of funds management. Just lower your deposit rate to the Federal Home Loan Bank curve. I'd actually be at or below the Federal Home Loan Bank curve, knowing I could pick up the phone and borrow. That makes a huge difference. Right? Capital plans are becoming a norm. Most of you have a ton of capital. We won't spend a lot of time on, on that. But one thing I will say is that middle piece, increasing your capital ratio by shrinking, is not generally the best thing to do. Higher capital ratio doesn't necessarily mean, you know, better credit union. Right? So in these uncertain times, taking action, you know, make the best of, uh, you know, a tough situation. I try to point out to you some of the things that I think are kind of getting in the way of taking action. Some very simple but uh, yet, I think, powerful strategies that you can put into place. And uh, final thought in terms of managing regulatory expectations, just make sure that you've got your arms around your risk position. Uh, and I promise you, it'll go a long way um, with the regulators. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm a few minutes over. At this point, um, let's open it up to questions. I don't know if any questions came over the transom. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that came over. Maybe we'll start with uh, this first one. Um, how do regulators view wholesale barns? Uh, it depends who walks through the door, right? So I can tell you if if if, um, if used um, properly, which I assume you would, um, regulators look very favorably. You know, if you've got all of the if you've got policies in place, you all the things I just showed you up here. You got your arms around it. Regulators can't right, refute the strategy that you have in place because at the end of the day, it's managing risk. And wholesale funds are an acceptable part of an overall um, risk management and liquidity management process. That's a quote paraphrased um, by, by the regulators. I think what, what gets in the way is credit unions think regulators don't like it. Or they think, I'd rather pay the member and, and not go to the wholesale market. Using the wholesale market I can't imagine not using the wholesale markets. Um, and you know the good news is, and again, I had one regulator, one credit union examiner, right? Um, when I went through all the reasons why, he said, I don't understand why more credit unions don't use the wholesale markets. I said it's because of people like you that come in and scare them as if it's it's bad. And I just showed you how it can be used effectively. Do, um, do the regulators have a percentage to, of uh, borrowings to total assets, uh, like a bogey that they uh, kind of look out for? Again, um, there's a lot of inconsistencies out there. I can tell you I have, uh, I have a number of credit unions that are at their absolute uh, regulatory limit. Um, I have one credit union that's, up, that's at 50%, right? They don't get a one in liquidity, but they don't get a three, right? They're at their max. I can tell you some regulators will come in, and if you've got borrowings in the books, they want to know why. There's others, like this one client of mine, um, that has almost, almost 50% um, of the balance sheet funded, right? And yet, he does just fine. He gets a two in liquidity. It's high of a level of, of, of borrowings as it is, because he demonstrated how he uses them prudently. And then what we do is we show, well, we can unwind all these borrowings, Look what the impact is to our income and our risk and our capital uh, accumulation. So again, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to defend and articulate your position with the regulators. I don't think our worlds are that far apart, right? And what's the difference between a wholesale borrowing versus a deposit, right? One's insured, one's collateralized, right? I mean, anybody can go out and raise deposits, right? But I think you can use the wholesale markets to your advantage. 
especially when times like this, from an interest rate risk perspective, forget about getting long-term CDs. So those of you that are scared about putting on long mortgages, if you really feel the need to hedge and put on a longer-term borrowing, you can't get it any cheaper with no insurance costs with a high dividend than you can get right here. So, again, that's a commercial for you guys, but that wasn't my intent. Frank, there's another question that uh, came through here. Um, what's your opinion regarding consolidation in the industry, and uh, when do you think we'll see uh, an increased M&A activity, uh, particularly as it pertains to credit unions? Okay. I brought that up in one of my slides, and... Uh, as I said, I think you're going to see massive, massive, massive consolidation in the industry because all the things that I just showed you guys today, that's real. These aren't made up. These are real. It's not just the banking industry. It's the credit union industry. And yet I don't see a lot of credit unions taking action for all the reasons that I outlined. And so it's, it's all in the math. It's all in the numbers. Unless they have a dramatic change in either reducing operating expenses or there's a significant pickup in rates, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon, many of them are just going to atrophy away, and they're going to be forced to merge. Unfortunately, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here's another one, uh, Frank. Um, what's your opinion on the NTUA stance uh, that FHLB shouldn't be viewed as an emergency liquidity provider? You know what? That, that question has come up over the last, uh, since 1933. You know, probably. Um, and that is, uh, one thing I can tell you is um, the Federal Home Loan Bank, as long as you have the collateral, right, they will let you. In fact, I think you guys even have that on your website, right? Yeah. Stated, right? You, I mean, you guys actually stuck your neck out. Um, I promise you, the Federal Home Loan Bank system has always been there to support, right, its members, right, their members. Uh, all throughout thick and through good times and in bad times. I mean, you have to be in pretty dire, dire situation, right, uh, from a credit, you know, capital standpoint, earnings standpoint, um, before, right, there's a problem with the home loan bank lending you money. And you know what? By that time, you got a whole nother set of issues, right? So, um, you know, I, I can't imagine why that would uh, be a barrier for uh, anybody looking at, uh, you know, wholesale funding. And lastly, Frank, I'll take this. Uh, one, uh, one individual wanted to um, get a suggestion on how, you, how you, if you've never borrowed before, how do you get going? Um, you can just call us uh, here at the Home Loan Bank. Uh, call your calling officer, Alex or I. We'll walk you through it. There's a first-time borrower's guide right on the web. Uh, essentially, you have to make sure you have the proper collateral in place. Um, and you have to get the proper authorization together, and uh, we could all walk. We could walk you through that uh, personally. So uh, it's relatively easy, but there's definitely some things uh, you need to know before uh, you get moving on that. Yeah, that's. So, I mean, that's that's simple. But again, make sure you have policies in place. And if that, if anybody needs help with any of that stuff that I talked about today, you know, call call your relationship manager at the home loan bank. We'll get on a conference call and we'll walk through this stuff. What I don't want you to do is walk away from this today and say, yeah, that was kind of interesting, but, you know, we're never going to get there. I'll help you get there, right, if it's, if it's a matter of, you know, getting on the call, uh, the conference call, walking you through these things, helping you, you know, with, you, with your policies. I mean, I mean, I'll offer this out only because I know very few people will, will take me up on it, and that is if you want some help with your policies, if you want some help looking at your interest rate risk position with some recommendations over Contact your relationship manager. They can contact me, and I will help you guys. Now, if all 68 of them call me, I'm in trouble. But I, I, you know what? I'll, I'll, statistically, I don't think that's going to happen. Right? But I, I hope, I, I truly hope that you've taken a, at least one good idea out of today's that was worth the, you know, an investment of your time. Uh, as you can tell, we're, we're very passionate about this. We want to help you succeed, and you know, we're there to support you. Both. Um, you know, the folks at DCG and, uh, and the folks at the Federal Home Bank. So uh, I appreciate the time, and I hope that was uh, what everybody was expecting. Yeah, thanks a lot, Frank. I just wanted to mention one thing. Are you, this could be a follow-up survey regarding um, this webinar. We want to uh, look into doing more webinars in the future, so we'd appreciate if you took a couple seconds to get that, you know, give us that feedback. Also, there's going to be um, – this webinar is going to be available um, 
we're going to be sending you out a follow-up email with the recording of the session, so you'll be able to see the uh, presentation and hear the dialogue once again. But uh, thanks a lot, Frank. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. We Thank appreciate you. Uh, everyone attending today, and we'll see you soon. What did I do before that uh, sent that thing into outer space? Did I ever put the last slide up?